All right, you get ready. This, this is, I can't wait to tell you this story. Hi, I'm Henry Way. I'm a doctor and I'm a geek and I work for Aetna. Get ready. These are amazing graphics. You're going to get blown away. All right. I'm part of something called the Aetna Innovation Labs. What the heck is that? Well, you're about to find out an example of the sort of stuff we do. And this isn't a PowerPoint. It's not a Prezi. I'm not going to zoom in and out. These are awesome 2D graphics. You can't see them anywhere else. It starts in 2012, and uh, we had just spun up the labs, and I was getting excited. I'm going to give away the story, which is we built a massive real-time comparative effectiveness and drug safety engine off of some existing technology that parses 5 million members' worth of data. The cool part is we actually did this in six weeks because I had to go to D.C. I had just been asked by Todd Park and gang to go work with the White House as a presidential innovation fellow on this thing called Blue Button. It's really awesome. Can't talk about it right now. Different story. So I have to go to Greg and explain, hey, you know, like how we started this thing? I got to go now. Good. Can you finish this before you go? Yeah, sure. No problem. What? Rajesh was also the guy on our team. Greg Steinberg, doctor, cardiologist, all-star head of clinical innovation at uh, Rajesh Mehta. He's actually a pharmacist and all-star pharmacoepidemiologist, and this is what we built. Now, you actually have to go back to 1998. We used something called the CARE engine, which was originally designed for a different purpose. Basically, it takes a slew of data. This is claims data, and everyone likes to badmouth it, but it actually has a lot of stuff. It has ICD-9 code, CPT, LOINC, drug and utilization review, and you can actually figure out clinical patterns from within it. It's not that bad when you actually take the time to figure out algorithms to apply against it, and you can do clinical decision support. You can do predictive modeling. You can populate personal health records. You can Julianne Fries. It's great. This is a guy, Lonnie Reisman. He's a cardiologist. He actually also happens to be the chief medical officer of Aetna now, but at the time, he had actually founded the company and built this basically from scratch and set a precedent for a wave of health IT companies that were to follow in the same vein. Get the data, massage it, get it into the right place, and then do something awesome with it. So that's Carrington. And just to prove to you that I'm not just kind of drawing slides, this, this is actually an example of the types of evidence-based medicine rules it runs. But what does that have to do with our story? Well, one more pit stop, 2005, 2008. Care Engine succeeded because it was ab actually able to show stuff in randomized clinical trials. You needed to test whether this was just purely hype or whether it was actually delivering value. And it showed 8.4% lower hospitalization rates in a randomized clinical trial of commercially insured individuals, about 40,000 split into two groups, and about $2 million worth of savings. And this catalyzed, again, a huge movement for lookalikes, uh, as well as eventually the acquisition of active health by Aetna. All right. So what were we trying to do? Well, we had this great thing called the CARE engine, and we were saying, well, boy, this looks like we could use it for drug safety and comparative effectiveness. You see, it, at the core of it, it's pretty simple. You build a two-by-two table, and you're comparing what is the rate of an adverse event in this population that was exposed to something versus what is the rate in this other population that was exposed to something else or not at all. And there's some statistical nuances to that, but that's basically the core of it. And because we had this system that could detect clinical patterns really fast in a really big population, we thought we could pull this off. And we did. This is ultimately what it looked like, which is that we were able to take a library of nearly 40 or 50, 50 drugs and outcomes and cross-match them against each other to find the relative risks and also statistical thresholds to determine specific signals and basically build an inkblot uh, type diagram and a heat map of the entire risk of, of these combinations and do so on a very large data set very, very quickly. Now, I blew past that. Why? Because that's not the end of the story. If necessity is the mother of invention, then discontent is the father of progress, to paraphrase Thomas Edison. And this is, you know, again, pardon for the awesome graphics here. We were thinking as doctors, we were thinking as clinicians, and we were saying, well, that's not good enough. I don't want to just find out an adverse event is related to a drug. What if they weren't taking the drug for the right reason? There might be a difference in the adverse event rate. So we actually drilled in and started doing filters by indication or by comorbidities. What if they were taking it for two reasons or sort of a reason, but not really a great one? Usually you get an FDA report that this thing is bad, it's killing people. There's one adverse event and we found it and this is the rate. If you actually drill in, you're probably going to find 
surprising results, and that's what we found. And we didn't stop there. We have this vision for a personalized data analysis, which is that any doctor should be able to go into a database and say, well, that's great. We see this in the data in terms of an overall population rate. But what if you're a woman who's 65 years old, or you're a man who's 25 years old? What does this mean for you out of our actual data? Again, subject to a lot of statistical methodology that I won't go into here, but let's say we risk stratify that as well. What does this mean for you? And what we call this are little black boxes. Can we get smarter from an FDA or other standpoint about where we should draw these black boxes around some of these drugs? And then we were thinking as clinicians, but these adverse events don't happen by themselves. They're stories. They happen not just suddenly just drops out uh, dead of a heart attack, but they had chest pain. They got testing for it. Um, my little story below of Pac-Man eating a, a red pellet and feeling bad. He gets an x-ray and then he decides to eat a power pellet because that's what makes him better apparently. So there's a story attached to every patient experience. And I know this, I'm a primary care internal medicine doc. This is how we see clinical outcomes happen. It's not just that discrete data signal. So what this looks like in the data is basically looking for the constellations of patterns. Is there a reason to take the drug? If they actually do take it, do they develop symptoms? And what does that look like? Are there alternate versions of that? Are they testing for the adverse event or not because they're kind of worried about it? And is that test actually confounding it? Only then do you actually worry about looking for the diagnosis or the outcome of interest. And even if you don't see it, you should be looking for the treatment for the outcome or alternate diagnosis if the doctor missed it completely. Now this constellation is really not an approach that's used today, but we decided to deploy it. Unfortunately, it was mentioned up front, but we're actually uh, applying for a patent for it now. So <laughs> we can basically make sure that this uh, gets built up uh, in a big way. And the thing I would liken it to is this. You can get fooled by single data points and signals, but we encounter corroborating signals in everyday life. Take radar, satellite, and barometric pressure. You can combine these to be more accurate about weather. It's not just about the statistical methodology. It's about the different data sets you apply, and even the different methods to you, you look at the same data set. They're all looking at the atmosphere just with different methods. Another example might be feeling an elephant. Right? It's an analogy, but basically one guy's going to feel the tail of it, and they're going to, three blind men feeling an elephant. Oh, it's a very furry creature. Another one feels the foot. Wow, it's kind of a squashy round fe feature. And then another one feels the trunk. Oh, this is sort of a prehensile type snake-like animal. No, you, you actually need all the perspectives. And where this comes out is other types of analyses that we've been able to deploy, a plausibility chain. One of the central missions of the Innovation Labs is to actually test out new clinical and technology ideas ahead of the market and make sure they're actually valuable. And we have to see that not only does it actually pay off in the end, but there's actually a process, a clinical, all of these other metrics to support. Because if you're missing any of these, you're less likely to believe that it's actually working and it's not just a fluke. So this is what we do, and this is the innovation labs. The labs we use as a metaphor because we're constantly experimenting and testing in a fairly scientific way on really awesome stuff. We identify future state technologies. Again, we go nuts over accelerating it way faster than sometimes maybe we ought to. And then we test it against hardcore clinical metrics. And then if it works, we try and run like crazy to scale it up and prepare it for business to make sure that we can actually deliver it to real lives. There's a lot of hype, and I hate to say this because we're at StratRx, but you got to admit, there's some stuff here which is like big data. OK, yeah, yeah that's great. That's cute. But there is a difference. There's a barrier. The, the, I put a bunch of buzzwords there. Clinical outcomes and patient engagement, these are measurable, and you should be able to design rigorous tests against, against them. And uh, think as a scientist, but with a caring mind, this is what physicians do, and determine what's really valuable to the system. This, by the way, the real value is why active health survived the economic downturn shortly after its founding. But it was, it was actually useful, both in a clinical sense and in an economic sense. So that's it. That's the end of the story. The moral? A few things. One, try to do the humanly impossible. We couldn't do this with the support of data systems. It wasn't just trying to paint a prettier graph. This was genuinely impossible for us to accomplish without the assistance of technology. And the other thing, 
always think about what the clinical impact is going to be. We were inspired thinking as doctors as to how are we going to actually use this someday and how would it make it awesome for a patient? Even if they never knew it existed, how would we really help them way beyond what we were doing today? So I'm Henry Way, and thank you so much.